thank you all for coming out here uh, tonight. This is a wonderful opportunity uh, for us to put on with the artists that helped make the aroma, when the aroma happen. Uh, we're very fortunate to have Wayne White here and his wife, Mia. Thank you guys very much for coming. <laughs> really appreciate the shout out you gave out last night for tonight's event. So, this is the Palace Picture House. Uh, was born out of the Chattanooga Film Festival. Chris has been doing these events in basements and warehouses and pretty much anywhere that he could find a place to project the movies onto for the sake of bringing film and art to Chattanooga. He's been doing this for over seven years. Finally have a permanent location. Uh, I joined him about a year and a half ago to do an art gallery we call Swine. Uh, we'll try to rename it, but we're still Swine. All this time. Yeah. And uh, just super excited to see you all here. So without further ado, I'm going to bring uh, David up here, and we're going to get this thing started. So you got bring him too. You can't yeah. Come on. Uh, I knew something was happening in Chattanooga, but didn't know what. 
So I did some Googling and found out they needed volunteers. Uh, so I emailed Bob. He got back to me and said, come down. And we started volunteering, and then we started coming up about every weekend for a while. Uh, we were addicted to it. So um, I personally was in a really big art rut, and I just couldn't bring myself to make work. I was in a lot of self-doubt. Um, when I worked with Wayne, I just felt like he was very encouraging for you to just make work. You know, who cares if it's not your media? Who cares, you know, if it has meaning behind it? Why does everything have to have a concept? Um, I was playing around with a lot of ideas, and after the very first weekend working at Winorama, I went home and I just started making work. And work I don't usually make, I started drawing. Uh, and I actually hate drawing. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, that's actually where the Paper Dolls came out of. I started doing the Paper Dolls series um, about very personal work, actually. It was totally different. Um, and after working at Winorama, I worked on Bessie. Of course, I worked on the mountain. Uh, everyone does. Uh, <laughs> but um, a few different other things at Winorama as well. Um, but Wayne told me I should make puppets. So I was determined to make a Wayne puppet, and so my version of a Wayne puppet was a paper doll. So that's how my piece came about. Um, and it went around and really drastically changed my life. Um, I'm making work on a regular basis again. Um, and I'm just really, really excited that all of the artistic um, energy that you get from working with Wayne. If you went to Wayne's talk last night, you would know. Um, you literally just have to hear and talk about making work and you get excited and you want to go home and make work. And that's exactly what I feel like Winorama was for all of us. So, We are calling Brandy up next. <laughs> Stunted in the art field, so uh, went all the way through elementary and junior high. And uh, the one I, I told Wayne that I remember the one time that I saw him really advance. It was before we were going to compete to draw for the school newspaper, and uh, which of course Wayne ended up doing. And I guess he knew somebody. But, uh, <laughs> maybe they had money. I don't know. But anyway, so. <laughs> So what happened was uh, I was sitting in front of the teacher's desk because I was class clown and had to sit in front of the teacher's desk. And Wayne came rushing up after the teacher walked out of the room and slid in next to him and he drawn these, these eyeballs, almost like a Garfield, oval eyeballs with the half lids and the little dotted eyes and, and they were shaded and, and they were just formed fantastically, you know, and, and I don't even remember the rest of the character around it. And I remember looking at it and kind of saying to him something like, you know, where'd you, where'd you get this from or where'd you see this? And he goes, no, I just came up with it. And I was just dumbfounded. And that's where all of a sudden I saw that we went from doing Flipper and Snoopy. All of a sudden, you know, he was going to be going a different, you know, a different route than I was going. So. But I was glad, you know, I got to see it. And, uh, and uh, I told him when we got together here at Wayne Rollins last year that, you know, I was proud to have known him and got to see that because people don't get to see that in their lifetime. As far as uh, his influence, he influenced me as we, as we were doing growing together, doing little statues and and, uh, and doing our cartooning. And even though I didn't advance as he did, it you know it, it influenced me in that way that you know I wanted to do what he was doing. And um, my piece out here is is a window, as Wayne says, like a window into the art world. As you look out and the, and the painting is there, and it's done with uh, cardboard pieces in it. To uh, actually give the relief to the picture, give it the depth, and that was influenced by Wayne because in my past I was a graphic design artist, only worked with pen and ink, pencil, spray, and had not painted. So working with Wayne through Wayne Rama, it, it, it got me to where I wanted to paint, and I still wanted to use something I'd learned there, which Wayne works with everything from cardboard to foam to wood, and so I thought if I could mix that into one picture, then use my own idea, you know, let's see where that goes. 
but that's my influence on the piece. And I'm just proud to know that uh, we grew up together and, and I get to see this happen. Thank you. Stays in Chattanooga, stays in Chattanooga. Uh, next up is Stephen. Little Stephen, who has worked with Wayne before and has just, this this guy's brilliant. If, if you guys get a chance, spend some time looking at his mural and then go talk to him and look at his sketchbook because that's the, where the really just, I, when we were still on the show, he came and showed me his stuff and I was just like, man, dude, you're on another level. Like, it's amazing. I did all the artists in there, but like, to be that young and to do the stuff he's doing, it blew my mind. I was like, oh my God. So come on up, Steven. If there's one thing I've learned, it's failing gracefully. My journey started out at Maryland Institute College of Art in 2010. I went there, that was my biggest dream. And they kicked me out because I couldn't afford it. I wouldn't take out student loans. So my next part in my journey was going to work in burrito shops and coffee shops, where I would be the loudest personality. I would say, I'll do anything you want, whatever size, no matter how small or how big. I painted murals the size of, the size of buildings and done designs the size of thimbles. And I have just been willing to try anything. And so it's just... I've wanted to learn my whole life. And so through my journey, I've like when I work, I always choose to pay attention to artists and in making work. I, I somehow stumbled onto Wayne where I saw beauty is, beauty is embarrassing and what I saw was ethos. And that's like this need to make. An artist that is, isn't about image but is about the need to make art. And like there are, I honestly there is beautiful art everywhere, but I very rarely see art that is about the art. And so, like, honestly, I'm not impressed by a lot of stuff, but I was thoroughly blown away the moment I saw Beauty is Embarrassing. And so, that shit changed my life. Not to say shit, not to say all that, but from that day on, I was like, man, this is cool. So I kept making art, and uh, one thing led to another, and a guy who was looking at this blog post I made about Wayne was meeting up with a girl I did work for in a magazine who was looking at Wayne White Prince, who found out that Wayne was doing a show 30 minutes south of my town in a coffee shop I worked in. And so she's like, Stephen, would you like to come to meet Wayne? And I was like, what are you talking about? I just heard about this guy like two months ago, and it blew my mind. So I went to see Wayne, and I was like, man, I love your stuff. And he's like, well, if you love my stuff, you should just come work for me. So I came work for him for a month. Well, I, okay, so first off, right after, yeah, right, right before that, my coffee shop job tried to fire me. Like, so that's my second greatest failure. So they said, we're only going to have you work on Saturdays, so that allowed me to work Monday through Friday for Wayne. So I was like, yes, yes, yes I can do that. So then fast forward uh, a few years later, I'm in New York City, and I found out Wayne has a show at the Joshua Liner Gallery. And I heard about Wayne Arama through some website like earlier that year. I'm like, whatever that is, I gotta do that because that's in Chattanooga, where he's from. That's cool. So I come and I ask him, like, hey, can I come work for you again? And he's like, yeah, sure, come do it. So I come and uh, I work for a month again, and then uh, another year goes by, and I get asked to do this show where um, they tell me to like meditate on the effect Wayne has had on my life. And so I hadn't really thought that deeply about it, but then I did. And so the mural I did out there is literal and metaphoric. It's both, the first time I worked for him, I, made, I helped make an 18 foot tall soldier with him. And then the second time I worked for him, I helped make a mountain. And then I also thought on the, the effect he's had on my life. It's like, Wayne is the general, always depicting uh, uh, Civil War scenes. And as, a, as an artist, you're kind of climbing a mountain. So like this general of, of an artist has helped lead me through this ascent up a beautiful, beautiful mountain. And if you guys have driven up uh, Lookout Mountain, you'll see there are signs going all sorts of ways. Like, you don't know which way to go. Like, you know, like, that's what it is. And like, through my brief encounters with Wayne, I've learned to get okay with uncertainty, with failure, with 
a little bit of everything, and I feel great about uh, my, my, my choices. And, and my reflection on women is, you can have that too. still kind of trying, trying to fill that out. But, uh, I, sorry.
so pony, right? <laughs> he only does I, one um, I got acquainted with Wayne's work, like many, I'm sure, sitting in my underwear, eating <laughs> fruity pebbles. <laughs> and um, I did that for quite a few years. That was actually my goal in life. This is, I have reached that to. Um, so, but I, and then I spent most of the years I should have been in college high with other people watching VHS recordings of Pee Wee's Playhouse, but I still didn't know who he was until just recently. And he's definitely changed my life. The, um, I'm going to explain Milo, because when you look at Milo, it, uh, the link is uh, tenuous at best. It doesn't look like it, it means anything. But, um, as any artist, when they get too caught up in their own head, you tend to start looking for something to make, rather than just making what you should be making. And um, so Milo was born out of that. I was, a, I was a bit of a strange kid. I know that's time worn, and many people say that in these, but I really was. And it lasted nearly until adulthood. Um, so, <laughs> but I'm good now. So, but anyway, um, <laughs> so, but, um, I was, uh, my grandfather was very eccentric, and at, he owned a petting zoo, <laughs> he uh, raced cars and motorcycles to the point where he was inducted to the uh, Dirt Track Hall of Fame. Uh, he, he just, just an odd guy. He, 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 used to, he was a left-hander, like me, you know, and at a time, it was the 70s, so you got reminded by adults constantly that you were using the wrong hand, and they were all pretty sure they were the first one who said that. But <laughs> they were. And um, so, anyway, everybody, every, every book one had, their family has the, the myths that follow them around, those time-worn stories that people tell time and time again. The edges get knocked off, and little details get added. Sometimes the complete falsehoods get added, and they get added to the story as well. Well, um, from my earliest memories, there was my My grandfather had a pet lion as his junkyard dog. And he was in the backyard guarding the, the, all the vehicles that were impounded and the ones that were destroyed, and he had a service center in the front. And um, because of the kinship that I always felt and because of the otherness that I felt that he had that I had, I, I equated Milo spending time with him because nobody else could come near Milo. And, but he could roll on the floor with him like a dog. And so that was always, that was one of those stories that just kept on getting told and told and told. Well, um, to make matters better, um, I moved around there for six months to a year when I was a kid, and so that's good for making friends, and a lot of different ones. But it, but I would um, tell that story because it was I felt like it was emblematic of something, and I, I wanted to share it. It was a cool story. That's great when you're five years old. Seven, not so much, and nine years old, it really goes off the rails. <laughs> and so I tell this group of boys that about I got mocked mercilessly for the story. Your grandfather had a pet lion, they would say. And so much so, which was good that we moved every six months because we were needed to get out of here. And um, when we when we left that location, I learned a, a an unvaluable lesson. Well, a lesson that it's taken me many years to shake, and I, I wish that I'd never learned it in the first place, was that if you show too much of your own story, that it hurts sometimes. Mm -hmm. And I've been busy trying to tell somebody else's story, and I'm no longer going to do that. Mm -hmm. I was so embarrassed, you know, and, and in fact I thought, well, you know, I am an idiot for actually believing this story, you know, that, and so then it, you know, it went on for many years, and I'd never told that story again, obviously. And I got into my, I was actually probably in my mid-twenties, 
and we went back for a family reunion. And we're, you know, as you do, you're all sitting around, and they have photo books, and everybody's looking through everything. And somebody pulls out a photo. And it was of my life. And my grandfather. Which would have been real handy when I was young. <laughs> after that, all those voices that had been talking to me about it. But Wayne made, me, made it possible, made it help me pull them off. He believed in my ability to do, I get, a lot of times I, I do such technical things that I get pushed into that box too much, or I get, you know, and it was great to be treated like a multidiscipline artist that I could, I was a maker, I was a creator. Yeah. And so, I tried, for a moment, to paint something that I thought would work well with everyone else. It was shit. <laughs> I'm serious. It was awful. And so I tried that one more time, and apparently I tried things way too many times. Anyway, the third time, I said, no, I'm not. And um, I picked up the trowel, because I paint with brushes. I don't paint with brushes. I paint with shovels. And I painted something that I showed something that I was way too embarrassed to show or even talk about to anybody. And I made it. I, when I walked away from it, though, it was a piece of art. It was not a craft anymore. It was not something I needed to sell somebody. It was art to me. And that's, that's my truth about it. Wayne gave me back both. Yeah. I liked Jason's piece for the texture and the beauty of it. But when he told the story to me, yeah. man, <laughs> he's talking about a very powerful piece. Close. It is. And one of the beautiful things that Wayne we'll talk about is the power of art. Mm -hmm. He believes in that. And that's kind of accumulation of this is the power of art. Like what happened to all of us? How did it transform us? You know? I mean we know it had an impact on Wayne because Wayne has expressed that, which is amazing. But also it's reciprocated. I keep fading in and out and I can hear it. It's reciprocated back to us. And the impact in Jason's story, man, that was just, whoa, dude. So for that, you know, trying to fit it in, it didn't matter. That's the beauty of the show. I didn't, we, Amy and I didn't want anybody to fit it in. We didn't want Pee Wee's Place out, Playhouse replicas. We didn't want Wayne White cardboard sculptures. We wanted you. And that's what we got out of the whole entire show. So that's a big round of applause for that one. Man. Seriously. <laughs> There's enough people copycatting Wayne. Go down to Lupe's Pizza and look at that horrible word painting that's sitting up there. It's bad. <laughs> that shit is horrible. I text Wayne. I was like, look at this. You got a copycat. He goes, oh, my God. <laughs> so with that said, this guy who has been a staple at Wayne Arama, there's a, some people that just kind of move around. But Mr. James, man. James... James is a shit. He is. And if you don't like James, then get the hell out of here. <laughs> awesome, thank you. Uh, quick technical question. How many F bombs do I get before you guys take this away? Seven. Seven. I'm limited. I'm limited. I'm going to use them right up front. Well, before I start counting. I'm going to try not to, but I apologize in advance. I'm going to talk about my piece a little bit, but I want to lay a little bit of groundwork first. Not too incredibly long ago, I found myself driving to the south side to go to volunteer at Wainarama for the first time. And I was very excited about it because I thought 
Chattanooga in general and the Chattanooga art scene in particular could do with a, a little more weird and a little more fun. And I thought Wayne was the perfect ambassador for that. And when I when I went to a uh, I went to TopCon and he announced that he was going to do work here. I was really pumped about it because I thought he was perfect for it. But I don't play well with others. Um, <laughs> I'm a control freak, especially when it comes to art. Um, I also have the annoying habit of knowing that I am always right. <laughs> so I wasn't sure how well I was going to work with this group of people that I was going into. I didn't know how well I was going to take orders, essentially, from someone that knew better than I did. Um, so I got down there that first day, and I went in there, and it was fucking amazing. I'm sorry, that's one. <laughs> uh, it really was, though. I want to put emphasis on it. I was blown away that first day. Everything was taking shape. And I, I, I hesitate to say this, because when people say stuff like this, I immediately think they're idiots. But there was energy in that place. And I knew something important was happening. I knew I wanted to be a part of it. And at the end of that day, I had met Wayne, I met a lot of people. I saw how work was going to be done. And I realized I was going to keep coming back until they told me not to. <laughs> and I did. And so far, they haven't told me not to. <laughs> It's like, it's good, I like that. 
And I said, it's all right, it's all right, but it's not perfect. And this is one of my major takeaways from my aroma and why I did the painting the way I did without a lot of preparation. Why I did this talk the way I did with a lot of without a lot of preparation. He said, I don't want it to be perfect. Perfect is boring. And I'm going to use that in the rest of my artistic career because I get so hung up on things being perfect and they end up being sterile. And it kind of takes the fun out of it. And more than anything else, when we're almost fun to make. I'm one of those guys that's never done. It's not that, oh, he stood up. I'm using my time. Um, <laughs> you use my time. Fuck, James, come on. I felt, it, I felt it was really successful, and I love my painting. I love my painting. It's not perfect, and that's why it's awesome. Oh, yeah. How could you not love James? I mean, he did everything. Man. I mean, that was all good. Like it was, it set the energy. So the next guy, he traveled and he came in, and, and you gotta check out his work. You, you gotta definitely look at his work, Battle Babies. He does some crazy, crazy <laughs> shit. I didn't know it was, I thought it was PG-13, so I was keeping my language down. <laughs> James starts dropping F bombs. I'm like, okay, I didn't know it was gonna be that kind of party. Um, Brad Raider does some amazing shit, and if you see, look out here, you see the Castle of Grey Skull. He sold that piece on the opening night, which I thought was amazing. This guy walked in, a friend of James, was like, I gotta have this piece. Um, come on up, Brad. Said, envy is embarrassing, but 
I took everything I did very seriously, but I didn't take it seriously at all. And that's how I kind of live my life, but I also live it my way. And the two of us, I'm not going to get emotional and tough like I'm Miss Brian. <laughs> <laughs> but, but like I just try to spend every single day doing things the way we want to do things. Oh, yeah. And sometimes it works, and sometimes it's hard, but... Every single day, we had a friend come and stay from Connecticut, another artist friend of mine named Junk Fed. He came and stayed with us a couple weeks ago, and we didn't even realize we were doing this. But every single morning, we'd wake up, and Todd was like, the thing that, I, that amazed me for seven straight days, but every morning, your, uh, your bedroom door opened, your dog came in, looked me in the face, and the next thing I heard was the two of you laughing. Aww. Every single morning. I like it. There's, there's not, no matter how aggravated we go to bed at each other sometimes, or how bad the day was before, every single morning we wake up laughing. And that guy, that guy did that. He planted that seed. I, he didn't know he was planting, he didn't plan on planting that seed. And I just appreciate that he let me come down to Winterama and just make stuff. And I'm supposed to probably talk about my piece, but it's, the piece that's out there, more than anything, is. It's all of the people I work with every day. It's this guy, it's that guy, it's James. Like James was talking about control. Like I'm a little, try to be a control freak, but I'm a little inner attentive on the things that I make and the things that I do. And when I found out James was going to, just for time's sake, was going to be painting the things I was making, I didn't think I could handle that in the moment. <laughs> and then I came in the next morning and I see that he made me something I could never make. Right. And together we made, and that's a lot of what I do. I work, again, I work in the toy industry, and I do a lot of collaboration with a lot of different artists. And the thing that I've learned is we work together so much better than we work apart.
Uh, and when I was little, I thought the Grateful Dead dancing bears were just like the cousins of the Muppet Babies. <laughs> so I had this dream when I was little that I was going down this endless slide throughout like a dark tunnel. It's kind of like a disco floor. And I was like right behind the Muppet Babies and I just wanted to like reach out and touch them. And I couldn't reach and I was like, oh, I just want to know what the cartoon feels like. And that curiosity never left me. I always wanted to go from two dimensions into three dimensions, uh, which is something that I also see a lot in Wayne's work. The two dimensions going into the three dimensions, back into two, it's just its like an expansion and contraction of time and space. It's really cool. Uh, so Wayne's work got his claws into me when I was really young. It was so whimsical and wacky and theatrical and wild, and it never talked down to you. Everything was alive, too. The chairs, the walls, the floors, the flowers. When I was little, um, I remember saying to my mom, Mom, I want to be a flower when I grow up. And she just kind of laughed it off. And then I just kept on thinking, like, why? Why can't I be a flower when I grow up? And it was only, like, while I was making this piece, the Brain Mash 1990, that I realized that I probably thought I could be a flower from watching Pee Wee's Playhouse. Yeah. Uh, so that was, that was pretty cool. Uh, I also loved Beatman's World. Uh, it was, like, my favorite way to learn because it made learning so fun and everything was just so stimulating. Uh, and yeah, so I think like feeding a kid's imagination really helps them to like be excited about learning. So thank you for raising the right TV. <laughs> so working with Wayne felt to me like pulling back the curtain and meeting this architect of my imagination and when he told me about his inspirations and his influences, it was kind of a big aha moment for me, seeing, for instance, how Red Groom's work informed his work, and then how his work informed my work. And it felt like I was starting to see this web of influences that was tangled and long and just stretched back so far like to the cave painters. And how cool is it to be part of that same web going forward into the future? So I wish I could be there tonight and tell all of my fellow artists that you are all my inspirations. And um, thank you, and I can't wait to work with you again in the future. Uh, thanks to David and Amy for putting the show on, and uh, I hope y'all are enjoying the show. Thanks. You guys know Megan is the one that helped resolve the water yeah. on Dragon Canoe, and that is just wicked amazing. Because <laughs> we're down to the wire, man, and it was like, how are we gonna figure this out? And she comes in and just knocks it out and Eight knocks out. Like, go. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> if you if you pulled an island on her at opening morning Rama, raise your hand. <laughs> There you go. Oh, and man, she just, she, man, she's got mad skills. And what's cool about that is that she got in touch with a couple of us, me and Brad and a few other people, and kind of said, hey, I got some stuff that might be kind of working your way. And that's that communal thing that starts happening. We work with Matt Dutton, which is amazing, and a couple other people. And that's, a, again, kind of going back to that power of art, you know, you're working with folks. Um, man. <laughs> There's just no introduction for Mari, man. Like, Mari, 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 the first time I met Mari was the, the night of the opening, before the opening, and it's like she's in there in this red jumps with the red cover all suit, and then just like, she would just keep popping up, popping up, and her, the energy is just so infectious, man. It's just, she's always bringing us great stuff. Come on up, Mari.
my mother was supposed to see Rory Orbison. All right. And of all places, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Go figure. Um, and geez, my parents were recording. I don't pop this microphone. I don't understand. Um, my my parents were recording Pee Wee Playhouse for me before I was even conceived. They had some kind of disastrous plan in store for me. Um, I don't know. Do, do we have any of these slides prepared over here, Elliot? Um, I knew I wanted to be an artist from a young age, but it took me a long time to find my way. That's me at my eighth birthday party. My, I had a magician, you can see him right there, and um, he put me in this swamp and he told me that I was going to create a painting before my eyes, but I had more fun flailing up. Go back to the last one. <laughs> Oh, oh, is this an auto plan? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I had more fun flailing the paintbrush at everyone and yelling, I'm an artist, I'm an artist, I'm an artist. <laughs> and a year later, next slide, that was me. And that's me with a bunch of stuff that I made. That's, that's a puppet and a Green Bay Packers cheerleader and, and various other things that I made. And ever since then, I've been making stuff. But I never really found my place as an artist until I came to Wainarama. I never really wow. felt at home as an artist until I came to Wainarama. Yeah. And, um, geez, where do I go from there? Um, <laughs> I've got a couple of photos of me. I didn't get everything together because I slept too late. But um, I've been involved with cardboard art for years and years. I remember my first found object trash art sculpture was a vacuum cleaner with a gallon of milk in its head and a wig that I named Mrs. Doubtfire. <laughs> but, but that's me as, as a Ghostbuster with a cardboard proton pack. That's one of the first major cardboard pieces I ever made. And I've been deeply involved with the cardboard art in Tucson, but when I moved to Nashville, I didn't have a place. And I found out that Wayne was throwing Wayne Arama, and I came down here, and I feel like at this point, I've done something on every piece in the entire place. I've, I've at least made, helped maintain it. So it's, it's amazing to work with all of these incredible artists. And I've had a complete blast. But this is, this is what I've done, and I can't wait to see what I continue to do with the help of all of you. Oh, yeah. So a quick note before I introduce the next artist. Uh, Mari was known for being the rebel red suit coveralls. Um, so just to give you a little um, insight to the name of our show, um, Cardboard Coverall Dreams, Wayne loves to work in coveralls. And it was his signature. He'd come to work every day in his coveralls. Uh, so on Halloween, which is David and I's favorite holiday, we decided we were going to dress up as Wayne. Uh, and go to work at Winorama, because we really loved it, and that's what we wanted to spend our Halloween doing. Um, so that was the start of uh, coveralls, uh, besides Wayne. Wayne was the only one to wear them before, uh, and I was so nervous. Because at that point, um, James kind of touched on it, is that Wayne's very quiet. Um, so yeah, he... told you. <laughs> If you watch his documentary or you went to his talks, he says he loves attention, uh, but he loves attention on his terms. He's very quiet, he's very observant, and I was so nervous because at that point I had barely talked to Wayne, and I had been there about three or four times by then. Uh, so when I stood outside the door in my mask, and my, my beard, and my hat, uh, for about five minutes, and I'm like, what is he gonna think? He's gonna think I'm a freak. He's not gonna, he's not gonna think it's funny. Oh my God. 
Uh, but we walked in and people loved it, and so we dressed up as Wayne, um, and it was awesome. And from then on, you just everyone started wearing coveralls. Um, we have to wear a patch. Yes. Uh, if you don't know, um, I designed the Lena Rama patch for my coveralls. Go buy it, Lena Rama. Right now. <laughs> So our next artist um, was a really big help. Um, he did a lot of things that people will never realize how much of a big help he was. Um, he's a fantastic artist. However, he's also a fantastic carpenter. So he got stuck building a lot of walls and figuring out how to hang stuff and fire codes and all that <laughs> fun stuff. And he didn't get to carve on the mountain and all that. So um, he got to make a really fun piece for the show um, that he didn't get to do for Lena Rama. So, Miles? Yeah. Quite a bit with what he's done. He's, he's 
had a lot of jobs I don't think he really wanted to have necessarily to, to feed his, help feed his family. Um, and so, you know, it's like you get a, probably get a small budget for some of the things you're doing and you, you work with the materials that, you, that you've got on hand. So that's kind of how I organized how I was going to make my piece. I thought, man, I'm going to stretch myself. I, I'm going to make something 3D. I've never done it before, and I'm going to make it out of some damn foam. <laughs> I didn't get to use that stuff. Yes. <laughs> so that's what it is, man. It's foam, it's hot glue, it's wooden dowels, um, aluminum foil. And I put it together, and then as I was putting it together, I was like, man, I used to like build model tanks and learn how to weather them and make them look battle damaged. I got all into painting it like I would have painted a model tank, and uh, it worked out pretty good. Um, but, I, but kind of before this, I, like I said, I hadn't reflected on it a whole lot, and what's happened, just to kind of finish up, since I made that piece, was it made me look at, at, at three-dimensionality and color, and it just totally gave me a different aspect on, on working with materials and, and art and building up images, and so it's really spurred a new series of, of paintings for me that are totally different than anything I've done before, totally looking at color differently. It's been, it's been really good. It's a real fertile period right now. I, I owe all that to having been over there last year. Nice. I'm going to try to keep it under. Um, yeah, I bet. Oh, 